Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the sixth lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of North American mammals. And we're going to talk about helminth diseases, also called nematodes or metazoans. But before we do that, as I always do, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me these fantastic images, which over the years have allowed me to put these lectures together. So if we're going to look for worms that are not hard to find in wild mammals, let's start in the GI tract. You're pretty much guaranteed to find some there. And we're looking at the esophagus of a white-tailed deer. And if you look very closely embedded in the thick white mucosa of the esophagus, you can see this long spirurid nematode in this sort of serpentine appearance, what some people call a ribbon candy appearance. And this is gondulonema pulchrum, uh, pulchrum meaning beautiful. And it's a very identifiable uh, nematode, which you can see in the mucosa of the upper GI tract, uh, in the oral cavity, in and around the tongue, and along the esophagus down into the squamous lined four stomachs of ruminants. Uh, it really doesn't do much of anything. It lives within the mucosa. It doesn't really cause much inflammation. And you can see it in a wide range of species, from rodents up to non-human primates. And even people from time to time will get it. It's, said it's supposed to be a very annoying sensation to have these worms traveling through the mucosa of your oral cavity. So that's gondulonema pulchrum. If you look in the stomach, um, there are a couple of other also spirurid nematodes that we can see fairly commonly in a range of uh, uh, wild mammals. This first one, you're not going to miss it. It usually doesn't cause any problem. And if you had to put a morphologic diagnosis on something like this, I'd probably call it a catarrhal gastritis. Catarrh meaning a, a very superficial mix of mucus and maybe a little cellular debris, but not real inflammation. Um, this large worm is seen in the stomach, once again, of a wide variety of species. This one is a possum, and possums are like, uh, I forget who said they're like walking natural history museums. So you see a lot of parasites in them. They also very handily uh, are reservoirs for leptospirosis with minimal problems. But to get back to this helmet, this is Physoloptera, and there are a number of species in a number of, of mammalian hosts. So you can see them in raccoons and possums and, and feral cats. Uh, Physoloptera turgidum or Physoloptera rara or Physoloptera propitialis are all species that uh, you may encounter from time to time, uh, although you have to find an expert to speciate them. Uh, here's another large spirit in the stomach of a raccoon. The stomach doesn't look quite as bad, but these these uh, nematode parasites usually aren't to blame. This is Nathostoma. There's uh, a lot of different species of those. Nathostoma hispidum, uh, for those of you who have to have a species name on this, would be a good one. Um, Nathostoma is a, another spirit. It has a a fresh water crustacean uh, uh, intermediate host, usually some sort of rotifer or cyclops, and then you see it often in animals that are around fresh water, so raccoons would be a good one. Uh, can you tell this from Physoloptera? Physoloptera is a little bigger, but these are both large uh, gastric spirura. They don't cause much problem. They very rarely will cause ulceration, and then you wonder, is you know, are they just incidental to a very stressed animal who's going to develop ulcers? Anyhow, here's a great picture. We're in the abomasa, which is a, very similar to the stomachs, the true stomach of uh, ruminants. And this is a bison. And, whoops, and you can see that the lining of the abomasa is... Let's ignore this sort of hemorrhage here. But it's very corrugated, and you can see nodule formation... Um, and it's very similar to what you might see in trichostrongyle infections in a cow or a horse, for example, or a sheep. Cows generally get ostertagia, ostertagia. Well, this is also 
is a uh, uh, a trichostrongyle infection. Trichostrongyles are very small, called hair or threadworms, that live essentially on top of the mucosa. They don't embed themselves or invade the mucosa. They live on top and they cause irritation. They wiggle and jiggle and they tickle inside you and you get this proliferation in response of the epithelium. And so you get a lot of epithelial proliferation which becomes initially corrugated then nodular and there's very little inflammation. It's just epithelial hyperplasia uh, due to the presence of these very small worms. Uh, you can see them with the naked eye, but not usually on a photograph. Um, and another important point is this particular bison was infected with trichostrongylus axii. And you think, well, that's a horse, uh, that is a horse uh, trichostrongyl. And it truly is. Horses will develop a very similar lesion uh, with trichostrongylus axii. But Usually, that's a parasite of ruminants. And horses, um, if they're run on the same pastures that that uh, cattle have grazed and, and pooped on, will pick that up and, and have a clinical infection. And so will bison. So trichostrongyl saxi is truly a ruminant parasite here causing disease in ruminants, although we usually associate it with the horse stomach. Moving on into the intestine, uh, who would want to not have a picture of Bayless Ascaris in a raccoon intestine. And I'm going to show you there are a number of Bayless Ascaris. There are other ones. Here's Bayless Ascaris columnaris from a skunk. But let's go back to Bayless Ascaris uh, procyonis in a, uh, in a raccoon. And Ascarids, we tend to think they don't cause much of a problem. They generally are seen in the highest concentration in the duodenum, and if for some reason the uh, one end gets anchored there, they can act as a linear foreign body and cause an ulceration or perforation, uh, especially in young animals. You can have large infections that may cause ill thrift or even a blockage. Um, but Bayless Ascaris sort of stands alone. Um, we know through stories from our childhood about uh, visceral larval migraines uh, in, in children from toxic canis when the, the uh, if you ingest accidentally uh, the eggs of this then the parasite may hatch out and the immature larva will go on a walkabout through the body, not knowing that they're in an aberrant host and can end up in, uh, uh, in, in various organs or across the placenta and cause some devastating lesions in developing fetuses. This is not unique to humans. Bayless Ascaris procyonis uh, is well known because it causes some of the worst uh, visceral larval migraines in many, many species, including humans, but in just about any other species, including both mammals and birds. Uh, and one of the problems with Bayless Ascaris is that the body just does not seem to catch it um, and wall it off as well as it does many of the other Ascarid parasites. And so, uh, especially if these parasites get into the brain where you can't afford to have larvae migrating through. They will migrate and wander. They will continue to grow. They may even shed their cuticle as they get larger. They just don't seem to be stopped and, um, and they can cause some devastating uh, diseases in uh, both mammalian and avian species, including people. Um, raccoons are, uh, they are latrine users. They often tend to, to poop in the branches or the crooks of the roots of trees at the bottom and they will use it over and over so you'll get large collections of poop there and it can be a source of infection for pets or for uh, for children. Uh, I have been to uh, uh, a number of times to a uh, very popular outdoor music venue here in Washington DC and if you look up on the eaves and over the roofs of the snack bars Right underneath them, people are eating and they're getting served food and drink. And you look and they're just covered with raccoon feces. And, and it's like, I'm not, I'm going to take my food next time. 
So you want to be very careful. Uh, and it's not a good thing to have raccoons living in your attic or anything like that because it's not the damage that they do. It's the potential of transmission of Bayless ascaris. So off the soapbox, Bayless ascaris, Procyonis, it's not the worm. It's the eggs. We've looked at this picture before. This is uh, uh, the intestine of a sea otter with carinosomum uh, in hydri, but this is an acanthocephalon. And if you work with any type of marine mammal or you work with a lot of freshwater mammals, uh, anything that lives in the fish and, and a lot of, of other animals that live in the water are going to have a lot of acanthocephalins. Uh, and usually they're fairly small, like not like the big uh, Macrocantharynchus or Rudinaceus of the pig, but they're small. They attach to the wall. Um, they can cause problems because they get a little enthusiastic with their attachment and they can burrow through and perforate. And uh, you, sometimes you just see a couple, sometimes you see a lot. But if you're working with uh, any mammals who are a quote unquote water mammals, and, and that would include the, uh, the raccoons and the the fishers and the martins and all that, um, running into acanthocephalids in the GI tract, not that uncommon. The big ones, uh, or at least the ones that I remember, at least in, in, in marine mammals, are, are Carinosomum and Prophocolis species. Okay, you got to look closely at this one, and we're going to look at this again in just a minute, but um, this is the intestine of a coyote, and if you look very carefully, you'll see these very small white tapeworms. And this is what a Echinococcus granulosus uh, looks like. This great picture by Donald O'Toole. And this is the very unassuming small cestode of canids, and it didn't cause any problem for this, uh, for this coyote. But we're going to see the, this is the mature form, which we see in the canid. And in just a, a moment, we're going to look at the immature forms. They look very different, and uh, you're probably already quite familiar with the hydatid cysts that they form. Uh, here's an, a, another cystocircus, and this one is sitting very happily on the mesentery of a deer. It really doesn't cause much of a problem. This is cystocircus tenuocollis, and you can see it in deer. Uh, more commonly, common intermediate host is probably sheep. They're often seen within the abdominal cavity in the mesentery or on the serosa. Um, they're not visceral in origin. The, the, uh, the definitive host is a dog, and they really don't do much. Another uh, nematode, a phalarid, um, they, and phalarids are common in the abdominal cavity of a wide range of species, um, from uh, uh, from a cervid host here, a white-tailed deer. You can see them um, in, in many species of non-human primates, um, and I'm sure that a lot of different wild species have these. This is Ceteria. Um, they have a wide range of names, but this is Ceteria, one of my favorite names, Ceteria yehi. So this is a Ceteria yehi, and these abdominal uh, phalarids really don't do anything. They wiggle and jiggle and tickle inside you, and, and they don't do much of anything. But you will see them on the uh, uh, along in the mesentery. So now we're moving on to the immature form of Echinococcus granulosus, which I just showed you in the coyote uh, intestine. There's a great picture by Kathleen Potter from the lung of a mountain goat. And what we're looking at, it's a, fixed, it's a bit of fixed tissue, but uh, what we're looking at here is a uh, fixed lung. And then we have a cross section of what was a very large cyst. It has a very thick wall. And inside of this is, this is called a hydatid cyst. And inside of this is something that's called hydatid sand. You'll see it on the inside. And what they are actually, each one of these is an individual protoscolex of a kind of caucus. And so when this mountain goat dies, and if the lung and the hydatid cyst is eaten by a canid predator, uh, then each one of these tiny little protoscolices 
will develop into a mature tapeworm within its gut and you know they're very small and so if it eats the whole hydatid cyst it's probably going to get a, a whopping load of uh, tapeworms if this breaks down into the ground and then the animal sort of sniffs and snuffles and gets a couple of them then it just gets a couple of tapeworms but hydatid cysts are tough they're surrounded by a fibrous wall um, and the animal can be several weeks decomposed and this is still pretty fresh uh, because it's protected from the environment so that's one in a mountain goat you can see that in almost any uh, intermediate host herbivores are the most common this one happens to be a vole a uh, nice picture by Monique Veers um, and you and it looks a little bit different here but they're usually seen because when the animal eats the uh, protoscolex, the hexacanth embryo hatches and goes through the gut. And then it gets, as it's passing through the wall of the gut, it gets into the portal system, which is its entry into the vascular system. Um, you can see hydatidus anywhere in the body, but because they initially enter the portal system, as you would imagine, they're normally seen most commonly in the liver. Liver number one lung number two but you can see them anywhere including the brain or just about any organ but the vast majority are seen in the liver the liver can be almost totally replaced or you could just have one um, and there is another species of a kind of coccus um, but it's not as common as a kind of coccus granulosus that's a kind of coccus multilocularis most often seen in non-human primates in which these cysts proliferate and become space occupying masses. These are generally one cyst. Um, there have been, uh, this This is a re-emerging disease. We know that for many, many years, but because of the encroachment of wildlife into urban areas, especially in areas like Europe where they're having a tremendous proliferation of foxes, um, this particular disease is, is re-emerging and becoming a more important once again. So, hydatid cyst, echinococcus, granulosis, a canine uh, definitive host. Oh, this is a great picture. I've got a number of great pictures here. Um, it looks very similar to what you would see in a domestic ruminant and these large fibrous tracts filled with black pigment and inflammation and necrotic debris are the result of infection by fasciolides magna, the largest of the flukes and one that is a death dealer for sheep and anything smaller and can be a real problem uh, in other ruminants as well because it migrates, it's large, uh, it continues to grow um, and it migrates through the parenchyma of the liver destroying everything as it goes. The definitive host are a range of deer species, including white-tailed deer and elk and caribou. Um, and rarely does it cause clinical signs in those species. But when it gets into our domestic ruminants, especially small ruminants, the size of this parasite, their unrestricted migration, the damage that they do is often life-threatening. Uh, it may not be... Uh, such in cattle, but the migration of the parasite may lead to focal areas of uh, damage and an anaerobic condition, which will in turn set off diseases of clostridial origin, including black disease with clostridium novii and uh, also infection with clostridium hemolyticum. So infectious necrotic hepatitis. Um, so fasciloides magna. Uh, this is, if I did not mention, this is a moose liver. So uh, cause significant disease um, in unnatural host. You can even see them in pigs. Uh, the uh, Generally, they are seen in sort of moist, uh, swampy areas because they have a multi-host life cycle 
like so many flukes, and use snails as their intermediate hosts. Fasciloides magna. Oh, here's a, a fantastic picture. This is a prairie dog. Um, and here is a, another picture, uh, this one from Mike Garner, of a prairie dog. But this is a, a disease that is seen primarily in rodents. Um, and we're looking at the liver. The liver is somewhat shrunken. It is hard. It is discolored. And this is the result of infection by a aphasmid parasite that goes by the name of uh, capillary hepatica for us oldsters. I think now it's called collodium hepatica. Um, it's an interesting uh, parasite in which the adults and large numbers of eggs live within the parenchyma of the liver. This is uh, one of few parasites that you absolutely have to, uh, you know, the worm that does, it passes absolutely no eggs. Okay, so the host has to be eaten either by, uh, for example, another rat, which would be cannibalistic, conspecific behavior, or maybe by another rodent species, or the animal can just decompose. These biopercolated eggs are very hardy and they will live in the soil where that animal has decomposed, but it's probably best transmitted by uh, eating the liver. The, uh, the adult worms spend their, the, the entire rest of their lives in the parenchyma laying eggs and the eggs cause granulomatous inflammation uh, and tremendous fibrosis resulting in this hard, very yellow liver. Um, then obviously the animal is probably at this stage going to die of liver failure because the tremendous fibrosis and mineralization that you see um, replaces the hepatic parenchyma. So capillaria hepatica or collodium hepatica. Well, let's leave the GI system. Let's move into the cardiovascular system. And this is a great picture of heartworms in the right ventricle of the heart of a coyote uh, by Dr. Martha Delaney. Um, and what can I tell you about heartworm disease in uh, canid species? Nothing that you don't already know about heartworms in domestic dogs. It, it mimics it very well. Remember that we can see heartworms in marine mammals. We talked about the uh, uh, that in the first lecture of this series. They also develop them. You can see them in a, a range of mustelid species as well. They are also susceptible to heartworm disease and can only support a much smaller load because their their hearts are much smaller than dogs. So they are susceptible. Uh, of wild felids can also rarely be infected with heartworm disease. So there are other species. There's a heartworm, Eurocerca, which lives in the heart muscle of, uh, of swans. It's a little different here, living in the, the my, myocardium instead of in the ventricle. But uh, heartworm disease, sure, you see it in wild canids who live in endemic areas as well. Now, here's a fantastic filarid parasite. Most of your filarid parasites, or a lot of them, live in blood vessels. Filarid parasites are characterized by the, 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 uh, the, the birth of microfilaria, which, uh, uh, which circulate in the bloodstream. They're often uh, transmitted by the bite of a biting fly or something like that. And, and the microfilaria always seem to find their way into the capillaries of the skin, no matter where the adults live. This is a great parasite that lives in a, a range of domestic and wild ruminants. Uh, probably most commonly seen are the more the definitive host are elk. Um, and what we're looking at here is we are looking at the common carotid artery, which has been opened up and you can see these filarid adults that have taken residence very specifically in either this artery or the maxillary artery in affected animals. And, and they just go ahead and give birth to all of these microfilaria, which, uh, 
get into the usually the skin of the head. Um, one of the problems that you have with having these large boluses of adult filarids in your carotid artery, here's a great picture right here of a cross section. This is the carotid artery, and these are all of the uh, uh, the filarid adults, which are packing it and, and causing a lot of obstruction. So what happens, this is a picture uh, from the National College of Veterinary oops, uh, Pathology, um, and so what happens in some of these animals, they will develop a disease which is known among shepherds as sore head. Um, they will have uh, infarction of the skin of the head, of the ears, of the muzzle. They may slough their nose. Um, and this is an aberrant reaction to the presence of these parasites. You don't often see it in the natural host, uh, which is the elk caribou or reindeer, but because it's transmitted by biting flies, domestic ruminants can get this as well. Iliophora schneideri. Look for it in the uh, the artery. One of the one of the things that you will see in white-tailed deer with iliophoriasis is impaction of the cheeks, impaction of food in the cheeks. And so what we see here is a is a white-tailed deer, uh, probably a hunter, shot it and one of his cheeks was just packed or maybe both were packed with food, probably due to nerve da ischemic nerve damage. Uh, here the cheek has been cut away to show you the large amount of food just impacted uh, in the cheeks. That's white-tailed deer. Iliophoriasis um, is the disease. Moving on to the respiratory tract. Here's a great picture by Elijah Edmondson, uh, and we're looking at a skunk, and he has very nicely cracked the uh, skull, and you can see in the very distal part of the sinuses, this point it looks like uh, it's in the skull, but not exactly sure. It's usually a sinus parasite. This is a, uh, a large spirurid nematode that lives in the sinuses of skunks called Scrubingulus, uh, Scrubingulus nasicola. And uh, it, in severe infections like this, um, usually it causes no clinical signs, maybe a little rhinitis, but who's going to know if a skunk has rhinitis? But in severe clinical signs, it can cause resorption of facial bones. I suppose it could go in to the cranial vault in severe infection. So that's Scrabingulus nasicola, big red spirurids. Spirurids, and we've seen a number of them, but the good ones are bright red because they have this uh, uh, eosinophilic material which fills their pseudocelon, which sort of sets them apart. And if you're looking at that saying, wow, that looks a little like Spirocercolupi. Yes, yeah, Spirocercolupi is the prototypical uh, uh, spirurid. Uh, that we see in dogs and, and other other species in the, in granulomas in the esophagus. So that's Scrobingulus nasicola. There's one in, in otters called Scrobingulus uh, lutrans in sea otters. I think there's probably other ones too. Uh, Scrobingulus. Good luck with that. Uh, but unfortunately, you can't look something up if you can't spell it. So this is S K R A S K R J A B. Y N G Y L U S Scrobingulus. It's named after a Russian parasitologist. And here's another. Uh, this is not Spirocercolupi. Actually, this is in the larynx. And I'm cheating a little bit because I don't often get to show a picture of uh, Mama, Mama Monogamus. You got to slow down when you say that. Mama Monogamus laryngeus. And it is another bright red spirura parasite. You always find them in little bundles in uh, 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 in the larynx, usually of uh, of ruminants. So this it is a little bit of a cheat. This is a water buffalo, um, but I wanted to show the picture of Mama Managamus laryngeus. Okay, so when you think of these bright red worms. You want to think of Spirocerca lupi.
And you want to think of uh, the one that you see in trachea of birds, also a bright red parasite called Syngamus trachea. Syngamus trachea and Mammomanogonomus, basically almost the same worm, uh, except one's in ruminant laryngea and the other one is in the trachea of a bird, but they're all big, bright red spirorid parasites. Let's go a little farther down the respiratory tract uh, into the trachea, often seen at the branching of the bronchi called the carina. And we're looking at small outpouchings of the mucosa here, which contain, if you look very carefully, small four and fifth stage larvae of Oslerus osleri. Uh, wild canids have a number of uh, lung worms per se. This is sort of a tracheal worm, but the the uh, the larvae are within the mucosa, and as long as the life cycle continues uninterrupted, these parasites will be uh, will will either mature or be coughed up. If they die, if they don't mature, then these granulomas will undergo liberation of the the filarid antigens, granulomatous inflammation become granulomas, ultra, ultimately mineralized granulomas. They usually don't cause a whole lot of problems, but in severe infections because of this particular location, if you get a large, lot of large granulomas, you can cause respiratory problems. This is Oslerus osleri. And this is just another picture of Oslerus oslerai. This one has gone back and forth from Oslerus to Phileroides to, I think, back to Oslerus again. But always present here at the carina. You can see it a little farther up, a little farther down the trachea. But if you see it at the carina, um, or you see mineralized granulomas, that's what you're probably going to be dealing with. Uh, here's a great one. This is a fantastic one that is seen in foxes, and this indeed is a fox uh, by Dr. Doust of the Atlantic Veterinary College, and we're looking at the caudal lung lobes. This is Capillaria orophila. which I know if I don't give you the new name, some helper's going to put a, a line under my YouTube saying, oh, you missed the name. So now it's called uh, Eucoleus orophilus. Why they changed the name, I don't know. It doesn't make any sense. It makes it difficult for lumpers like me to be able to group these parasites. Um, but a lot of the capillaria have been renamed as Eucoleus or Collodium in the case of... Uh, Capillary hepatica, but I like the old names. It helps me keep them straight. Well, okay, so in most wild carnivores, Capillary orophila lives within the mucosa of the uh, of the trachea, and it's a aphasmid parasites, and usually the eggs are coughed up and they go out, and the life cycle continues. Um, and in the vast majority, it's seen in the upper uh, respiratory tract. This is Capillaria vulpes. Well, hopefully they haven't changed that name. And Capillaria vulpes, because this is a fox, is seen in the, caud in the caudal lung lobes where it lives very happily. It, the adults will live very happily in the bronchial lumens, and you don't see it high up in the trachea. So foxes are a little different. They have them farther down in the, uh, uh, in the bronchi. So, you, Eucoleus orophilus, Capillaria orophila, or Crenosoma, sorry, not, uh, Capillaria vulpes. Lungworms, lungworms, you see them a lot in, in domestic ruminants, and uh, this is the deer lungworm. Uh, this is Dictycoleus filaria. Usually don't cause a whole lot of problems. You also see it in sheep. Uh, you can see a different species, Dictycoleus viviparis, in, uh, 
in, in cattle or in fell died in donkeys spills over into horses where it never really completes its life cycle um, usually don't cause a whole lot of problem most commonly seen in the caudal lung lobes in the bronchi where the bronchi are large and sometimes you'll see some greenish infarcts in the caudal lung lobes in animals with severe infections uh, they look bad they're not so bad a lot of times when the animals uh, die they'll sort of get washed up uh, f with some froth into the main stem bronchi. It looks like the animals had a horrible infection where it's usually been tolerating them very well. So uh, lungworms of ruminants, as Dr. Mead would say, no great shakes. Um, wow, this is a, uh, this is a skunk and, and this is a parasite that you will often see uh, within the caudal lung lobes of a variety of species. Um, the, this is a, a fluke note named as Paragonimus calicati, which uses a crayfish as an intermediate host. So it's most often seen in animals that have been around water or have been eating crayfish. Um, and they often are paired large flukes, which are present in a bulla within the lungs. Often you'll just see one. Uh, in the caudal lung lobes. This is a skunk, so a little bit of a, uh, I don't know that much of the infection, but it looks like there are quite a few in this particular uh, lung. So, but uh, most commonly you'll see them in, in, I guess in cats, they're picked up. Um, we had a great uh, Wednesday slide conference last year, and the Wednesday slide conference is as riddled with parasites as any North American mammal. So if you have questions on this, I always recommend you go back to the uh, uh, the, the JPC, the VISPO, the ones they slide commerce, just type in the name of the parasite, and there we have it in there. Well, here's another spirurid nematode. Spirurids really seem to, to uh, be photogenic uh, and cause a lot of problems. This is the foot of a snowshoe rabbit, and we have a cyst somewhere around the carpus uh, or the tarsus. And here in a raccoon, the cyst has been opened, and you can see this large spirur insisted spirurid, which lives in the subcutaneous tissue of a range of uh, mammals, usually those that uh, inhabit, once again, uh, a habitat around water. Um, and then when you open the cyst, you can see this long spirurid parasite. This is the spirurid known as Dracunculus. Dracunculus and Cygnus is a most commonly identified species in people, Dracunculus medianensis, also known as the guinea worm, and uh, is a large spirurid uh, which lives in the in the subcutaneous tissues, especially of the extremities. And then when the female gets large enough and needs to lay eggs, the cyst, as described by people who've had this, starts to burn. And so people or animals will go to the water and they try to, to uh, cool off the burning. And that's when the uh, spirurid, uh, nematode, the female, sticks her hind end out and releases her eggs back into the water. The water's contaminated and people with uh, cuts or injuries or animals can, can pick it and be infected by this worm. Um, it's an amazing life cycle and for those of you who are medical historians and haven't heard this story, if you look at the symbol of medicine over the ages, it has a snake uh, on it which winds around a stick entire thing is called the caduceus and it is thought that going all the way back and this parasite's been known since antiquity um, it represents the field of medicine by demonstrating how these worms are generally removed where someone takes a stick and winds the tail around and slowly slowly rolls the stick and pulls the the worm out of the of the cyst uh, so that's the origin of the caduceus, the symbol of medicine, or at least it's a really, really good and well-accepted story. 
Okay, we are looking at the mesenteric arteries of a raccoon. They are thickened, there's hemorrhage. You can't see within them, but they are within the lumen are norm or large numbers of adult female liver flukes. Uh, in the raccoon, who is the natural host, um, these are seen in sort of swampy southern areas like Louisiana and some parts of Texas and Mississippi. And the name of the parasite is Heterobilharzia americana. And the raccoon is the natural host. We see, uh, we can see the disease in horses that get mineralized granulomas. And what happens is the, uh, these uh, flukes will lay eggs. Um, and then the eggs, because of the location, the proximity to the portal system, will often get into the portal system and end up in the liver, where very much like what we saw with uh, capillary hepatica, collodium hepaticum, um, you get granulomatous inflammation, not by the presence of the adults, because those live in the mesenteric vessels, but just by the granulomatous inflammation and fibrosis that results from the eggs uh, ending up in the liver. So heterobilharzia americana. Uh, here's sort of a rare one, but uh, uh, what you can see in, uh, uh, in also in vessels, there are a couple of other estrongyle parasites that cause vascular damage. This is Angiostrongylus costa recensis in, uh, in the raccoon, causing remodeling of mesenteric arteries. Angiostrongylus. Angiostrongylus is usually seen in the uh, uh, in the lungs of uh, a variety of rodents. Um, they are one of the rodent lung worms, Angiostrongyla, and Angiostrongylus vasorum. is also known as the French heartworm, which will cause lesions in the pulmonary artery, a villar and arteritis, and, and changes very much like our own diarphilaria image. So that's Angiostrongylus bisorum. Angiostrongylus cantonensis is a lungworm of, uh, of rats, and uh, Angiostrongylus costarycensis here, uh, causing vascular remodeling in the raccoon. Oh, this is an uncommon one. These are uh, uh, intramuscular cystos, also known as sparganum, um, in the muscles of a black bear. Uh, you can see immature forms in a wide range of ruminants, um, cystus circus, which uh, in Domestic ruminants causes problems known as measly beef um, and, and tend to end up in small cystic cirque and metabolically active skeletal and cardiac muscle. And you can see those in wild ruminants. This, this is a different type of parasite. Um, the parasite itself is not a cystic circus. They are generally diphilobothrid parasites which live within the fascia and between the muscle fibers. And you can see this in a, usually there's a, a fish or a frog, which is the intermediate host, and then mammals are often definitive hosts, and the, uh, uh, the tapeworm ends up within the muscle bundles. This is a polar bear. This, I think this actual slide was on my ACVP exam uh, 32 years ago. So hopefully I'm not giving away any secrets. It's also, I got this one out of the Noah's archive. So it's been around for a long time. This is a polar bear. And uh, you can see these little white dots within the muscle. And I think if it was any species other than a polar bear or a pig, my first response, and, and one that we covered in the last lecture on protozoan diseases, 
would be sarcosis because everybody's got sarcosis, especially domestic and wild ruminants. Sarcosis, sarcosis, sarcosis. And we don't pay them a whole lot of attention unless you're a parasitologist uh, and you're really into those things. We just say, okay, it's in the skeletal muscle, it's sarcosis, big deal. Um, but this is from a polar bear, it could be from a pig. And uh, um, when you see these white foci within skeletal muscle fibers, this one being the diaphragm, you want to think of trichinella spiralis. Trichinella spiralis is, is a nematode in which the larval form will penetrate skeletal muscle fibers and insist within them and you will see a little curled up larva within a single skeletal muscle cell. Um, they form these nurse cells that protects them from the uh, from the, the the immune surveillance of the body. Um, usually the natural host is the, the pig um, and it can be transmitted by uh, and often is transmitted by polar bear or two polar bears who get into garbage and eat poorly cured pork products or something along those lines. So trichinella and you and people can also get it as well for I mean, poorly cooked pork meat. Um, this is not interestingly enough, it is not the only uh, larval nematode that will hide out in muscle cells, skeletal muscle cells. Uh, hookworms actually will do that and we had some confusion a couple of years ago in the Wednesday slide conference because a slide was submitted uh, as trichinella and it turned out to be ancelostoma. The difference between those two uh, is that ancelostoma tends to be a bit more of a wanderer and will it will go in and out of muscle cells doing a lot more damage than trichinella which sets up a long-term apartment uh, in that myofiber. So little white dit dots in a polar bear and probably some other species of bear which often will get into garbage and awful. Uh, and pigs think about trichinella spiralis. Hey here's a big brown worm uh, you know it probably uh, well, this one's probably tired. It should be a bright red worm, and it's gigantic. Now, uh, uh, if you look in the urinary system lectures, you'll see this in a dog. Um, this one is a, a really nice picture by uh, uh, Dr. Mark Chalkley, and this is in a marten. And a marten, if you're not familiar with that, are small uh, mustelids which normally live in and around water, and. Uh, this is Dioctophema renale. It is the largest nematode parasite of animals or man. People can get it. Um, it has a tropism from the kidney, but it's really big and often doesn't really get to the kidney. If it can, it will. It has three hosts in its lifetime. The first one is a oligokaid, uh, Paris uh, freshwater uh, tube worm. Um, and then uh, the first and second stage larvae live there, then they migrate to a fish or, or a frog or something else along those lines where they first develop their desire to get into the kidney. And so oftentimes you will find them, if you find them in the, the secondary host, you'll see them in the kidney. And then of course, when they get to their more definitive hosts, which are mammals, which live in and around water, but they're very happy to do it to people or dogs or or any other aberrant dead end host, you may find about 50% will end up in the kidney. 50% will be free in the abdomen, or they'll form a cyst within the abdomen, saying, I can't find the kidney, I'm just gonna form a cyst here. Sometimes in the uh, pleural cavity. Because these worms can get up to in a proper host, they're very long lived, and they can be three feet long. And what they do is they cause obstruction and destruction of the kidney, and obvious hydronephrosis and very little is left at the end but some fibrous connective tissue and the uh, the renal capsule. So dioctophema renale, people have had them said they had no idea they had them. Then all of a sudden for some reason they have an ultrasound or whatever it's like you know you have a giant worm in your kidney so you know I don't want to I know some of you are a little susceptible out there to uh, uh, to suggestion but you could have one of these worms and not know. 
So if you haven't had an ultrasound in a while, maybe you need to go run out, run right out and get one. Oh, this poor fella, uh, or lady, I guess, is uh, this is a moose and uh, tremendous neurologic signs. And if you are a ruminant other than a white-tailed deer, which is the natural host, and you get this long thread worm within your meninges, or sometimes there's a much better picture uh, in the spinal cord. They are tiny, but they cause a lot of neurologic problems. In, and this is Parastrophus tenuous, and the natural host is a white-tailed deer, and they run around. This also known as the meningeal worm, which tells you where it hangs out, and it causes a significant amount of neurologic issues for a meningeal worm. But when it's passed to an aberrant host, uh, any type of ruminant, then you're going to have uh, significant pro neurologic problems, even in the mighty moose. Well, we only have one left, uh, and this is a uh, uh, this is a coyote. This uh, particular picture was taken, Dr. J. Holshu, many many years ago, at Los Angeles County Veterinary Diagnostic Lab, um, which I believe is still uh, is it is you know its heyday was back in the 70s and 80s, but uh, I think that there may still be a Los Angeles County uh, Diagnostic Lab, but. Um, so this is a coyote, and we're looking at uh, a an adult female of Thalasia californiensis. This is a worm that lives in the conjunctival sac, sometimes gets into the nasal lacrimal duct of canids. It's spread from animal to animal by flies. The female worm lays her eggs in the tears, and then the fly you know, goes to the canthus or whatever to get a little drink, ends up with the eggs, then goes to another animal, transplants them there. Thalasia californiensis, it lives on the surface of the eye, you know, can cause some really irritated eyes, doesn't cause damage to the inside of the eye. And that's a quick, well, not even a quick, but that is a tour through some of the more common parasites, absolutely not encyclopedic. There are so many different parasites. I do always strongly suggest that you get a copy of the Pathology of Wildlife and Zoo Animals um, by Terrio Macaluse and St. Ledger. My complaints about the quality of the paper in the book aside, it has a great list for all of the different parasites genus and species of all the major species of wild animals. And even though the, uh, the book itself was a little disappointing um, in just in terms of construction and, and the quality of the paper, it comes with a wonderful online version that you get when you buy that book. So you can go online and you can just type in the genus or the species name that's gonna pop these up. And it's fabulous. Uh, it's a fabulous reference. Um, and Academic Press, when you come out with the next edition, uh, we'll pay a little more for a higher quality paper product. Um, but, but kudos to all of the many authors and, and certainly the tremendous amount of work that uh, Karen Terrio and Denise McAloose and, and uh, Judy St. Ledger put in. Well, we're at the end of this one. Hey, thanks for your attention. I hope that you are enjoying this series as much as I'm enjoying putting it out there. If you come to the Joint Pathology Center's uh, uh, Ask uh, JPC, uh, and we have a complete library of all of the videos of domestic and now wildlife species and all of the systems, at least the gross pathology. Um, and you can also find these on the Davis Thompson Foundation's Facebook page. That's a tough one. Um, but our YouTube channel has them all there. There's hundreds of hours, and, and I really have had a blast putting these together. So starting to wind down here. We don't, I don't have that many gross images left that I haven't shown, but we got a couple more lectures in this particular series, so I hope you come back for those. And I will see you another time. Good health, good luck, great happiness, and be safe.